Let me let me just start quickly to make a short introduction because it will be challenging uh, title of the panel. Could is or whether Adriatic can become a post communist ship, which was a kind of uh, idea fifteen years ago in the front page editorial article in Newsweek <coughs> after the war finished and somebody looking to the region, especially South Adriatic, said, my girlfriend capitalism come, this will become a holiday paradise for baby boomers from Europe to make their holiday there and to reside there. And nobody could have imagined that this kind of article might become reality. So the idea is here to discuss today and to find out whether this article and this idea is still valid or is the development progress taking place at the moment, showing that this could be a future. For this reason, we have invited players whom you can call kind of pioneers who are not just uh, there for playing there or taking big risk and they're already digging, they're already doing serious job. Uh, Adriatic is a big region. As you know, mostly composed by the coast of Montenegro and Croatia. There is a Venice as well on that Adriatic, but this is a separate state. And, uh, but Adriatic is interesting because it was 50 years under the socialism, communism. Then in 20 years of kind of transition process, there was 10 years war time. And in last 15 years, there was different ideas, progress, projects, etc. to move forward, but nobody really has a clue where the whole story is going to go. For this reason, there are so many places looking for a kind of high-end <coughs> development. And that's why I asked uh, Mrs. Gostova whether she knows about Kumba, because one of the projects which is most, at the moment, hottest one is the Kumba, <coughs> which you will see what's going on. At the moment, according to Forward, Southeast of Europe estimates and intelligence, uh, there are between three and four billion dollars investments ongoing. Two, three billions are in around one year pipeline program, and three to four billion in a kind of tendering and planning procedure. Meaning that at the moment, a realistic investments in the region are around 10 billion euros underway. There are much more investments planned, but as you know, many of those plans have been developed in the upturn, economic upturn period, and after the crisis, many things have been changed, and actually what you will see today, only serious guys have left there, not any more speculators and this kind of stuff. Let me introduce my panel. Here from my left side, Mr. Arne Liebmann, Chief Executive Officer from Cancer International. Ivan Kusalic, the project director of the, one of the biggest projects in Croatia, Park, Golf Park Dubrovnik. Mr. Saviris, you all know, he is a kind of real pioneer in this region. And <coughs> Mr. Unfortunately, <laughs> James Wilson did a heavy job there. He has to meet his investors. He was not able to come, but Jarvis will replace him very, very successfully. So, Rushica was a pioneer. The project who has been signed with Montenegro government in 2009, there was a heart of crisis. And my question to you, <coughs> would I would like you to explain shortly what is this project all about, to tell us all whether this 
prizes for for good or for bad for you, since I think the crisis has cleaned up the territory from many backwaters, and you signed the contract with the government in 2009, the peak of the crisis in Europe. Please, could I could you just tell us the structure of the project, project development dynamics, and <coughs> like any government. effect of the crisis was obviously another good thing. And when you look around <coughs> in Negro today, what you have are a bunch of serious investors because everybody else has gone. And left <coughs> with no speculation the gains from anything. And nobody is able to find partners with money for anything that's not already built and available for half the price. So that basically there is no room this makes the, the scene much healthier because we all have the same problems and we are all do, taking our time and we are all looking for funding and we are all finding it difficult to find banks that uh, are uh, able to finance the debt part of such a project. Accordingly, I think that uh, when you look at a project like Lutica, which is going to become a town, so like all our projects, Absolutely. You are not really worried about this uh, delay of a few years because, as I said, it's, uh, it's going to be going on forever anyway. You know, you're not going to be stopping. Even in Luna today, after 25 years, we still have tons of land and uh, we are still building every year and adding something or the other. Just 
like in any other town, if you go out to uh, in Berlin here, this town is a couple of hundred years old, but you find graves everywhere because they are still adding and building. So this is our philosophy when we go about a project. 700 hectares land bank within town of 10, 15,000 people together. That would be the uh, kind of number. final field done. Yeah. 4,000 4, residential, 3.5,000 hotels, etc. So uh, you need a critical mass. Yes. You know, if, if you have a village that's supposed to survive the whole year, you need to have enough residents to, to make your school work, for example. You know, if you're going to have a little hospital, you need enough sick people or the doctor is going to get bored and leave. So you need enough people to be living there the whole year. The biggest challenge as we we're discussing before you guys came is how do we keep the people busy in winter, both the residents and the visitors. And uh, I must admit that this is going to be my first uh, experience uh, with such a big challenge. I mean, even in Switzerland, where we have a similar uh, project, uh, we are not so worried about the seasonality because we just have shoulders.
don't think in terms of an overall plan, because as I said, we're building a town. And so first, we have to worry about getting to the absolute minimum phase that makes us claim that we are on the map. And then we worry about the rest. Okay. Let us see what next we have there. Uh,
So, Mr. Lipman, if I may call you Alan, uh, everybody is very much pleased having you here since this is your visit to a new continent as far as business development is concerned. And there are so many questions we ask. One is why Montenegro as a first in Europe? Does it look a little bit uh, different from your original one and only sense of place and you know this kind of stuff? Very small development compared to the bigger one. Could you please could you please comment and tell us what is the secret of this project and why Montenegro as a, as a, your preferred place to come to Europe? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thanks for finding your way here. Uh, certainly, location was not key to the decision this morning, but we're glad that everybody found their way here. Montenegro was a very interesting choice for us as we started to look at it. We knew we wanted to be in that coast and be in that environment, and we looked at a lot of sites. And I think the foremost thinking for us was to find what we thought was the most fantastic location in Puerto Novi that would allow us to build something very unique at an ultra luxury level. And we wanted a mix between residential and we wanted only residences, we wanted a marina, and we wanted enough um, draw so you could create a year-round environment. Because as one of our colleagues in the market said, the toughest thing facing all of us is seasonality. And there's not a silver bullet that's going to fix the seasonality issue. So we were very pleased to work alongside, um, trying <coughs> with our investment partners to come up with some And that's why we were very pleased to be announcing the first Henry Chanel along with the one and only within a resort. We're going to have nice convention and meeting spaces in there. And then we will build a wonderful summer destination. And I think that will allow us to build some of the world, some of the world occupancy, the annual occupancy that we face. I think one of the things that was also important for us was just the commitment of the government in, um, in working in Montenegro. They had been very aggressive in trying to promote the brand of Montenegro and work with it. And we have a lot of experience in a, as a company going into these destinations and really working alongside them. So the key thing for me was the right investment partners, a good government that was keen to work with us, the tourism department, the medical minister of tourism, for you to see what they're doing. Mm. Address the issues. I mean, let's face it, there's airlift issues, there's some issues around the airport that need to be addressed. Um, and just a willingness on government's part to really listen to this and understand it. We have experience in improving this in other locations. And then investors that were keen to put the capital behind it to get it right. Because in our business, the worst thing is to undercapitalize these things so you don't create a wow experience there and something that's very unique. And I think those three elements. Besides the fact that it's just a, a wonderful environment, you can do a lot of things around the culinary, the food, it's got a lot of things that make tourism interesting today. And I think that Montenegro is an undiscovered jewel. I think that our consumers are looking for places to visit. They tell us all the time, the one and only guests, we want to find new destinations. And we think this has the right ingredients to be very successful for one and only. Coming to the question of Montenegro and those projects and your kind of quality ingredients, we cannot forget that there is already a Porto Montenegro project which is underway and to be finished. There is a couple of other big projects, like the project of Katari Diyar, which is very much close to be done. So, as far as we see, uh, Montenegro is a small state with probably 5 billion euros GDP. And if the whole story continues like this, very soon we will have doubled amount of investment in a small country which does not probably have the capacity to, to swallow this in an, in an organ. So we are talking here about the building a new, new economy building a new kind of business environment. We are, we are really uh, entering into some major uh, surgery of a country coast. And uh, my question to both of you, Mr. Savilis and you, all three of you, Montenegrin, uh, part of the panel, uh, do, you, do you have uh, contacts with government? Do you have a cooperation? And, uh, 
what kind of uh, what kind of understanding with this uh, you have since this is uh, probably the biggest relative undertaking in the industry in Europe at the moment. From a personal perspective, and I think I can speak on that part as behalf as well, there's been an incredible relationship with government. I mean, I think, um, first of all, I think government really did their homework. They came and looked at our businesses, they understood the destinations we had built um, prior to us doing the deal. And then the cooperation from the highest level, we were outlining issues and what the concerns were, and there were issues that we dealt with. We're not going to be fixed overnight, but there definitely was an understanding and a commitment uh, to be part of it. I know with um, Bezemuk that's being on the ground right now, working through that, that just needs to be uh, Absolutely, and throughout all the levels today, we even have two representatives of our government here in the audience. Hello. And it's good yes, to really this is, we have here Vice, yes. Vice Minister of, of Montenegro and Tourism. Yes. So today. it's really, this yeah. relationship has been uh, very well done, and we've been cooperating really good with them on all levels, from the municipality, all the way to the, the Ministry of Tourism and Sustainable Development has been very, very helpful to us. And, and in inter process. Interesting enough, from a Kurzweil perspective, we've actually done some research and we've seen it ourselves. Montenegro had actually done some very good work promoting Montenegro from a tourism perspective. Absolutely. There just wasn't the product there to support it. And I think that there's a little bit of a head itself. And we <coughs> feel that there is a great thing to And I'm so <laughs> pleased to see, listen, normally I'm going to fight with governments to go promote the location. These guys were ahead of it. So um, I think based on that combination, we'd be very successful here. It's usually the other way around. Yeah, you, know, you do the product and you then beg people to come and try to market it because it's yeah. already there. And here we came, there was no product, but it was a country that was so sexy all over yes, the world. Yes, everybody, wherever you go in the world and you mention Montenegro, yeah. everybody has heard about it. But one has to give credit the uh, to the combination of the private sector meaning Porto Montenegro guys, sure. because they did an amazing job, yes. and the government of Montenegro for being everywhere, bragging about the natural beauty of the country in a way that made people actually believe that it must be already there, you know? Uh, is, is there any fear or xenophobia or something that uh, Montenegrins or Balkanians, <coughs> call it whatever you like, that you might be doing a new Dubai place? No, 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 no. I mean, I just think, you know, it's just so yeah. different. It's naturally beautiful. There's a great, there's wonderful fish. There's beautiful uh, organic vegetables in them. It's just like a totally different experience. So we're not even close to what we can You don't need it. I mean, well, if you well, didn't do all what they did, why would anybody go to a place that has absolutely nothing but desert and desert uh, uh, dust, you know? The natural beauty is extraordinary. <laughs> so, so let us, let us now move to a similar project, but just over crossing the border, which is not less than half an hour drive, but in another state, which is called Croatia. Called Park Dubrovnik. This project, it took it seven, eight years to, to become kind of realistic. <coughs> Investors have been fighting with different kind of opponents for seven, eight years. And I am glad to present to Mr. Kusalic, who is project director at this stage, to tell us a few words about them. So you see, this is Dubrovnik. And we have another, is it Dubai here or? Uh, Kumba, uh, Golf Park Dubrovnik, please, would you tell us what is this? Thank you, Mr. Pekicevic, for the introduction. So, Golf Park Dubrovnik, uh, it's a project situated just uh, above the old city Dubrovnik, which is UNESCO protected city. Uh, unlike the locations of the gentlemen we spoke before, Dubrovnik is a well established destination. Uh, not only this, Dubrovnik is a well established city with its history dating from 12th uh, century. Uh, luckily, we were able to acquire the land, the location of the project in 2007, which uh, positioned us maybe as the earliest birds in project development. For 400 hectares? Yes, the project area is around 400 uh, uh, hectares. It has one existing small village uh, with people living inside. Uh, altogether 20 houses who are 
mainly uh, living their lives from the agriculture and uh, very uh, primitive ways of uh, tourism. The project is situated around this small village and there is uh, one part of uh, organic uh, gardens and we want to enable, we want to uh, basically use this village and those villages to promote the destination. Now, uh, we came to 7, it took us almost 7 years to uh, get the licenses which we got from two for uh, The master plan enabled us to give us opportunity for development of uh, 240 residences, uh, forms of villas, three hotels, uh, two golf courses uh, with the first uh, maybe in the second stage and up to 400 uh, apartments or condominium uh, The project is uh, planned in phases, total in four phases. Uh, we think that uh, in the best case scenario, development of these phases will take more than 10 to 12 years. Nevertheless, uh, the project uh, has uh, few beautiful historic monuments such as old fortresses which are dating from the uh, 17th and 18th century. Uh, in a matter of uh, weeks, we are about to uh, start with the reconstruction of one of its uh, uh, fortresses, which has a spectacular view of the old city, Gronik, uh, and all South uh, uh, Adriatic coast, together with the beautiful islands. We, the, uh, you can see even the Montenegro mountains. Uh, a few months, in a matter of few months, I believe we will start with the development of the first golf course. Uh, and at the end of this stage, a small hotel and uh, up to 10 residences. Uh, residences. Uh, uh, in short, uh, as I said, uh, as the colleagues uh, before me said, seasonality is a big uh, issue. I would not say a problem, it is an issue. Uh, we are strategy is to deal this issue together with the uh, few stakeholders within the destination, such as uh, uh, public authorities in the Gromnik city, uh, uh, government authorities in transport uh, sector, mainly airport and port. Uh, we have a good cooperation. Uh, the government is investing heavily in the enlargement of capacities of the airport, not only because of our project, but uh, because of the whole uh, Dubrovnik as a destination. There is a new marina uh, plans, uh, which I hope will be finished in a matter of months or, or years. But uh, our strategy is basically to combine all these uh, stakeholders in creating the, uh, the grand destination. Uh, maybe we have a better starting point, because Dubrovnik is uh, well known nation with uh, uh, well-established but uh, old touristic infrastructure. Uh, Dubrovnik is the uh, town within uh, Croatia and Montenegrin coasts which has the most, uh, the, the largest number of uh, luxurious hotels which are uh, old and there we see our perspective and our perspective. In short. Thank you very much. And it is very important to tell you that today these three investors and these three big uh, project developers met for the first time. And they are doing projects oh, we know each other. in about... We, are, we talk all the time. Yes, this is, this is with uh, Mr. Lipman. So, uh, let me uh, this, this, uh, ask for another important question, in my opinion, compared to the... Uh, related to the general idea to build a destination, to build a global destination based on a group of serious, important investors, brands, etc. Do you think the critical mass is achieved with you guys and some other players who are around, or you still think a new commerce has to join and support the whole effort? I would say for, I mean, I can't speak for Croatia, but I think uh, for Montenegro, uh, we would be definitely looking very good once those guys open. And whatever we bring will be uh, a complement, but that Montenegro doesn't need mass. For sure, this would be the biggest mistake. And it is a 
totally unwarranted. This is a small country. There are only six, seven hundred thousand people. I mean, if I look at just, uh, I mean, if I compare numbers, I have almost a hundred thousand people living in towns that we visit. So for sure, they don't need too many people. And there's this exclusivity that Montenegro has created, uh, image-wise, should not be wasted by inviting more people than the country can actually accommodate. I mean, you don't even have people, local people, enough to, to turn a place uh, like Montenegro into a mass market like in Croatia, for example. So I think but this, uh, this means... Uh, we're totally fine like this. But this yes, means, Ali, that you will take also one of the mountain resorts in Montenegro to develop, like, uh, yes. other mountains. I mean, I think definitely uh, the day will come. I don't know how soon, but uh, if, uh, if anybody has been skiing in Montenegro, it's one of the nicest places to go skiing. Unfortunately, the season is a bit short. That's, uh, as usual, a big problem in the mountains. But uh, the vicinity from the beach is mind-boggling. You can take a, a helicopter and in seven minutes, you can go swimming on then go back and ski. Would, uh, would then, if, if this is your view, then would more <coughs> brands would help building this image stronger since at the moment... We, we have, have the best two brands, you know, yeah. between one and only and the Amman Resort uh, in Montenegro, you don't need, uh, you don't need more. You don't need Mary Pick, let's say, or somebody like... No, I'm talking about the, 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 you know, the small boutique type uh, of brand names that bring a uh, uh, lot of people. <coughs> certain type of people uh, has been secured. I mean, I think you're so spot on. I mean, that's all we look at from a one and perspective. I mean, we want to create this, and what we loved about it was the exclusivity. And there are other places in Europe that have built great tourism and exclusivity that are becoming who we say right now. And I think we're going to create great value here. We've got a great culture within Montenegro. And I think, you know, that's the beauty, I think, where the country has positioned themselves is the ultra-luxury tourism. You don't need a lot. You need the right quality, the right product, and the right air. No, and the country doesn't need a lot because it's a small country. Right. You know? yeah. so it's Why bother? Right. Right. Yeah. It's, maybe it's getting it right. And, and I doubt that the Montenegrins would like to uh, live like the, the guys in Dubai, you know, where they are uh, 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 endangered species, as they the foreigners call them. You know, the locals in Dubai have now become less than five percent of the population. So that's. That you would not uh, have anything against if, let's say, Qatar India would. Maybe with uh, four seasons. No, so I think the right brands at the five locations. We don't yeah. What we want, what I'm more interested in is the quality of the product and keeping the destination. We like the people. So we think bringing brands into locations work very well as long as they're playing with the highest of the market. What I don't want to do is be in a situation where you come in and you have a really low end product coming in and we're trying to really drive the yeah. NUR and you start finding it. <coughs> Imagine a massive uh, right. 2,000 yeah. room, three star uh, right. uh, uh, operator yeah. next to yes. one and only. <laughs> that that would be a but the government there is quite uh, open to suggestions and open to advice, which is something super rare. In today's world where everybody thinks that once he becomes a minister or president or prime minister, then he knows it all. I've never seen uh, so such humble people. I think probably the size of the country has kept them humble because they listen and they take advice very seriously and this is what's happening. And, and I think they've learned. They don't where they've made mistakes in the past and yeah. they don't want to do this again. And so they're very sensitive, I think, to the environment, to the product, keeping the sense of Yeah, then we have a issue of seasonality. Yeah. So What's a good idea about seasonality? Then, uh, <laughs> if, you, hard with the yeah. if, you, if you really, if you you really go dollar. for a, a, for a high-end high -end product, and uh, the question is how to, how to put more flights, more planes, more everything on the, on the, to the destination. Algarve case. Dubai case, there are big cases on much bigger space, etc. <coughs> but there was kind of developing a new destination. You are doing the same. And uh, is it enough players to be able to convert the destination, or do you think uh, you need definitely you are to, to stick with the with existing players? 
the question that you put before was, do you need, or are you asking something different now? If you ask me, do you need something, I say, no, we have enough good guys there. But if the country can take some more, yes, of course. I mean, okay. if the, the Qatari DR comes with the four seasons, we are going to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. The key issue here is also, regardless of the high quality you are advocating for, there is mixed use concept and uh, ratio between real hotel business and residential business. And in all projects what we have seen, it is visible that there is 60, 70, up to 80 percent of the whole development is real estate driven investment. There are many issues here, whether this is for uh, financing reasons or, but the key issue here is, could this kind of structure be long term sustainable and keep the quality <coughs> on the long term? And on the other side, the question, who is the buyer? Who is going to buy it? In, in my understanding of what Mr. Lippmann has said, is this is high value, and this villa will be costing 10 million, no. something, or no. 5 million. Or well, what is the... Right. I mean, I think uh, that, uh, okay. Most of the private developers have a price, mm -hmm. but you have a good range of money. Even for us, we're going to try to the exclusive inside. And you're going to do it. I mean, if you look at the Bahamas as an example, we have a one and only there. We've got a few residential development, but we also have about one and only condominium development, and it works very well. And it's a nice mix of people that decide to spend six months of the year there, six months of the year back there. So I think it's, it's finding that right combination. A little bit different to how you build these cities and what coming in. But we find that balance where people want to spend a bit of a mile of winter in some of these locations. When it comes to San Francisco, it's just finding the right balance. But I don't think you're also you're selling. I don't think it's on uh, partners. Mine said everything's at 10 million, 10 million euros. It's a balance of residential, but at the very upper end. I always you know, like to brag about the being able to offer a house for fifteen thousand dollars and a house for fifteen million dollars in the same place, and still manage to keep these people happy next to each other. So it, there is no such thing as only monoculture, only the ten million dollar guy. Nobody wants this nowadays. Even the ten million dollar guy but, but I've heard the, I've like, heard the gossip that like you that. are selling your apartments at the moment per four or five thousand euros per square meter. Is it true or is it just gossip? No, it is true. True. Yeah. Thanks to Porto Montenegro. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Porto and not yet Porto Novi. And when they finish, you will, you will. Yeah, I mean, the minute they have sold five or six of these ten million dollar villas, I'll be you see, super happy. We have a Montenegrin government here. Be yeah. better careful what we are doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also believe that the arena will be a, a major driver in selling these properties. Obviously, as uh, in our experience, that was the case in many other developments of similar yeah. intention. So, uh, Not only that, having more than one marina in yes. that area is going to be like a, you know. We want to move around, and there's a shift. I mean, I listen. There are certain destinations that I think that are traditionally European zone markets that have become overpriced. There's no value. The consumer is tired of getting burned, and I think there's going to be a great market to drive the quality and give them a new destination. Both in the boating and the <coughs> and at the same time, we have done significant markets, market studies, and the resorts of the of the. Size, for example, we are the, <coughs> the last were built in Europe approximately 40 years ago. So they are they have already established themselves, but nothing of this kind has been built in the last, let's say, number of years. So which opens a niche in the market for us to cater. <coughs> so you are not developing New Dubai no, down there, sure. and sure. then you are kind of replicating concept of Cote Azur, new Cote Azur on the Mediterranean. Well, I think you have to be careful about replicating. I think yeah. it's, got some, replicating. it's got such uh, natural creative beauty of its own. Yeah. So you're not creating the right environment and the right mystique and the right elements for tourism. And a unique experience. Want to come yes. in this, it's a totally yeah. yes, a completely unique experience based on our cultural and national heritage and the heritage of the region and when it comes to our development and I'm sure you're as well. But all our inspiration is taken and driven by the heritage that we have there, which is really wonderful and interesting and unique.
So we are going to offer uh, a, a great product in the market. At the moment, you are mostly speaking to Montenegro as a geographical and marketing name to, to, to be connected in your project. Uh, you have never thought about Adriatic as a, as a brand name, as a part of Mediterranean. This doesn't play in your marketing strategy any significant. From a personal perspective, I think the government of Montenegro has done an incredible yeah. job marketing well, Montenegro, its position right. We want to take on And from the perspective of us as a development, we also feel that the brand of Montenegro is a brand, great brand that we want to be behind. As a small business. Yeah. And uh, as far as Dubrovnik project is Dubrovnik brand, this yeah, is what I mean, you, you stick. And although the Adriatic brand is something nice to hear, I don't think that it is feasible to brand the uh, Adriatic because, uh, I mean, it's a relatively big geographical area with uh, uh, big differences. Uh, in natural differences, also in development, I mean, you have really bad examples of development uh, on Adriatic coast, which is not the case with this, uh, let's say, southern Adriatic, starting from Dubrovnik up to Montenegrin uh, coast. So maybe to use a south Adriatic brand would be much uh, easier to use. But as far as we are concerned, we stick to Dubrovnik. We really want to uh, uh, rent the destination of Dubrovnik and uh, we want to stick our projects taking advantages uh, of unspoiled nature, really beautiful sea, uh, rich culture, which is maybe the best uh, selling point, uh, if I may say so, for Dubrovnik and its uh, uh, development. And of course, this well-established uh, uh, tourist uh, 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 infrastructure. Uh, I really think that uh, what we we're discussing now is something, I mean, there is potential uh, natural beauty, there are quite uh, adequate developers, but the situation at this moment to reach uh, Dubrovnik or Kumbo or Montenegro, uh, for example, to come to Friday to play golf uh, during the weekend, uh, <laughs> during the winter season or starting from October <coughs> up to May, March, you don't have direct flight from any uh, European capital. I mean, you don't have direct flight from London, Paris, Berlin, anywhere. This is something where uh, there is uh, room for, our, for all of us to work together. I mean, this is something which really has to be uh, uh, done. This is a heavy work. And uh, I think this will be the major issue in creating the uh, destination. Because people want something that they will on their smartphone, book the ticket, and they will be there in three or four hours. Uh, unfortunately, <coughs> although the Dubrovnik and Montenegro is within two hours flight from any European destination, in fact, it's unreachable. And this is the maybe the major problem, which is solvable. I think that it is uh, uh, easily solvable, but you have to create really cr critical mass. You really have to have uh, 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 trustful partners who will persuade the airliners and uh, of course the airports uh, and we are talking about two or three airports uh, maybe may do all of them to stick in the same direction. That's why we have had this panel to, 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 to put you together for the first time. So it seems that this uh, realistic what guys you are doing it's really uh, fascinating although different people still would ask different questions. And uh, for me personally, as being kind of culture broker in the region, working for international consulting for 24 years, uh, I'm, I'm very much happy this has happened. And some kind of modernization of the past has started to take place. And uh, I would like you from the audience It seems logical. It doesn't seem that this is kind of danger for the region. 
it is kind of real internationalizing the business in the best possible way, in an organic way, no speculation, no, no nothing which could uh, spoil the image, etc. So this is a, seems to be a good story. But please, uh, what you have heard, you may have some uh, merit. Actually, I'd like to follow on the last comment about um, airlift. I've just been checking up the airlift, and it's appalling. It's getting worse to um, Dubrovnik. British Airways used to fly to Dubrovnik. Now you have to fly um, EasyJet, and many people will not take EasyJet over two hours. And how do how are all your uh, Middle Eastern colleagues, uh, Alan, going <coughs> to fly to? Uh, Montenegro, because I can't find any way of getting from Dubai to uh, Ponte Grigio other than uh, Istanbul, uh, excellent airlines, but surely people are going to want to fly direct. It seems that obviously the government, as well as all you project investors, need to start talking about this to airlines. It's you almost as though airlines have forgotten it doesn't about work like this. the whole you know, This is a clear case where it's not the chicken or the egg, the egg or the chicken. This is definitely get the chicken in place, it will okay. the eggs. Once you have the rooms, the guys will come. But nobody wants to uh, put an air. Actually, they do take, if I may suggest. I remember once, a long time ago, I actually connected for the first time the then head of the Hilton, uh, Michael Hurst and the then head of uh, British Airways and they actually hadn't met and uh, Michael Hurst said to the airline tell me where you are planning to open new routes and we'll put up hotels because actually airlines do not suddenly say oh we'll fly to Dubrovnik tomorrow they put it in their schedule a long time ahead Mary I'm from a personal perspective I can't speak for our partners but as you know we've not we've been in many locations where we've Face airlift issues. I mean, even if I look out at the North American markets when we we're opening the Bahamas, you know, to, we had the same issue. And we think it's a balance. We are we already are in conversation with a couple of airlines to start with it, but it's a combination between government, the private sector, and working this out. And then there's some discussions around who we want to get in some guarantees. I think it's a little early for us now, but that's definitely our approach. And we're starting to have that discussion, as you know, also. We're looking who can bring things. So we've already started to plant some seeds. There's a lot more work to get done. We have a little bit of time. But yeah, so it's going to be a very important aspect. Too early an effort is as bad as too late. <laughs> it's just finding the balance. <clears throat> listen, we hear you. We, we know that's one of our issues. But we're focused on it. It was one of the first discussions I had with Calvin when I met with the Prime Minister, when I met with the time with the Minister of Tourism. But I think there's, a, there's the right mindset to get a result. <laughs> Any other questions? Please. Just to link to the situation in Dubrovnik, is there any commitment from the, the government to sort out the border crossing? The current, in the summer, the, the crossing can be in for two hours plus three. Oh, yes. It makes it travel unpredictable, everything else. This time of year, fantastic feeling. But it, it's horrendous. Have we all been allowed? But for high-end guests, they don't need this border crossing. They will just, for those guests who will come to Dubrovnik to go by the helicopter, and they don't have this kind of high-end product. Yeah. 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 One more question, please. I was curious just to ask, we learned that there was a seven year time frame between the acquisition and licensing process in the property. What was the time frame with respect to the Bush and uh, Portland? One year. For us, it was one year. One year? Yes. I wouldn't be able to give you a number right now. Something like that, or? How do you? Yeah, I mean, for sure, we would be giving, handing over the keys for the before the end of uh, this coming year. And, and then the year after that. Oh, now we're working. Please. Uh, you want to 
question for uh, both, uh, for all the investors. Uh, Mr. Savir, uh, last year in the forum, you were asked the same question for the Andermatt property. Uh, what was the legal uh, status of the properties you acquired in terms of uh, acquisition? Did you bought the Lushtica and Combor, or uh, it's a concession? Um, you answered last year that you bought the Andermatt property for 25 francs per meter. How is the situation in Montenegro? We have a lease with the right to purchase <laughs> the, the land for the that is developed, yes. So that the buyers of real estate will have a title. So property. instead of buying 7 million or 6 million square meters, and instead of the government selling the land and then worrying <coughs> about the speculator just sleeping on the land and doing nothing, we developed this formula for them, which we have developed in other countries as well, and it suits everybody. The of course, you are giving certain incentives for the yeah. development plan and yeah. promoting the region. It is also the same to us. And Robin, question? Yeah, it's a combination of uh, all this, but mostly the... <coughs> <laughs> they both, they both, majority hold ownership with some parts of concessions in terms of right to build uh, the, from the local and state. So the, the, the bulk of the land came from private owners? Yes, yes. How I many mean, owners did they have? Well, uh, on my own I made like uh, 300 transactions. <laughs> okay. So, since we are... <laughs> sorry. Since we are out of the time, I, I will not try to do any kind of big conclusion, just a couple of takeaways, which I think are, first of all, this Adriatic, call it now South Adriatic, combined two regions, a uh, realistic issue, it's not anymore wishful thinking, because there are players, there are projects, money has been spent, this is one. Second, that majority of those big projects are kind of mixed-use projects where uh, investment risk management is kind of needed and this is going to be done in a way that doesn't convert the region into kind of cheap and mass tourism holiday place. Third, uh, there is a lot of work to be done since this is a startup of building a new destination on the global tourism map, which we are all witnessed in that this is going take place, definitely. And only what I can hope is that the next panel on Adriatic, call it South Adriatic, will be done in a, in a not such an uh, isolated uh, link. Uh, it will be much more, with much more players, since obviously in next two, three, four years, uh, a lot of good things is obviously going to happen there, and I'm Thank you to all of you for attending, especially to my panelists. Thank you very much for coming.